So if you have a Bible, open it with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. 2 Thess, chapter 2. So as we've been studying here in this wonderful small letter, uh, Second Thess, we've seen that the church at Thessalonica was in great distress. Severe persecution was coming at them from the outside, from the Jews, the Romans, and the pagans. Nobody liked them. And they were, they were being terribly persecuted. That was outside, and false teachers had risen up from the inside, and uh, false teaching, some significant false teaching was catching hold uh, from inside, that uh, and in the midst of all that, if, looking at what Paul had to write in his first letter too, that God was doing a major work through the Thessalonian church. I mean, it's the capital city of Macedonia, a large city, a couple hundred thousand people, uh, would be like in northern Greece in our day. And, and so God was doing this wonderful work to the point where Paul actually bragged about them to other people, to other churches. He would boast about them, he says. And so, uh, and the reason why he boasted about them wasn't because they had a great building program or because they were checking all the boxes on church attendance or because they had a lot of money or any of those things, metrics that very often people fall into in our day. The reason he boasted upon, uh, about them was that they were going through and they had great faith and endurance in the midst of tremendous pressure that was coming against them. And that's why he boasted. And in the midst of those trials, some false teaching was circulating uh, around the church, specifically that they were, uh, because of the persecution that they were enduring, some were saying, well, the reason that that persecution is coming about is because we're now in the day of the Lord. We are now in that time of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. Somehow we've missed the rapture. Remember, this is an infant church. They don't know a lot about what's going on. They, they're not, <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have a ton of theology to go with, let alone the, the vantage point of history and all that we do. So they're trying to figure it out. This false teaching springs up. Perhaps somebody said, oh, I think I have a word from the Lord. And then Pretty soon it caught hold, and then pretty soon it's circulating around. And it's become now a story, and then pretty soon saying, well, you know, Paul himself, I mean, he wrote this to us. And, and he's saying, no, 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 it's not a letter that was as if from us. It's, we, we've looked at that. So this false teaching has really gotten some traction, and the people were beginning to become very concerned. Not only did they have the pressure of the persecution they were going through, now they had the added pressure of wondering if they had missed it. If the, if the rapture had, had taken place and, and they weren't part of it and it was causing a great deal of consternation and stress among them. And so Paul then, after this is only a short time, three months or so after he sends his first letter, word comes back to him of this false teaching, this false doctrine that's taking place. And so he fires off another letter, this letter to them, so that he can bring correction and encouragement to them as a result of this false teaching. So as he does that, he lays out a sequence of events that must come about before the day of the Lord can occur. He's saying, look, it's not here yet, and here's why. And he gives them three things that have to take place before the day of the Lord comes. The first was the rapture of the church. He'd already told them, look, you are not appointed unto wrath. And I don't know what that means in your vocabulary, but when I hear you are not appointed unto wrath, guess what? I am not appointed unto wrath. And so people that take a different view on that, it doesn't make sense at the end of the day because the church has been spared from the wrath of God that's to be poured out on an unbelieving world. And so he says, that's number one. <laughs> the church is going to be out of here. Uh, and he tells he lays that out in First Thessalonians. He lays it out again here in Second Thess, and he's very clear that has to happen before the day of the Lord starts. The next thing that he talked about, the second of these three things, is there will be a great falling away. There will be an apostasy, a rebellion against God 
that has to take place first. And he's not talking about common everyday rebellion, which we all see and, and we experience. He's talking about a great rebellion. He's talking about a pushing against God that has never happened. He's talking about people shaking their fist at God in such a manner that this rebellion is totally against him. And, and that he said, that rebellion hasn't come about. And, and for these people in the first century, their, I mean, the Thessalonian churches had exploded. Word was going out. They were, they were being affected throughout the entire region of Macedonia, which is thousands and thousands of square miles. They're planting other works. They're being effective with the gospel, even though they're under it. And he's saying, no, that, <clears throat> that this falling away has not taken place. This apostasy, this rebellion. Third thing, the third event that Paul outlines uh, for them that before the day of the Lord is that the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, must be revealed. That he has to come first. So we saw last week that the Antichrist is being restrained. We talked about that at length. And that he will not be revealed until the restrainer whom I firmly believe is the Holy Spirit of God, is taken out of the way. So as we look at this, last week we looked at this, this period. That, now understand that the seven-year tribulation period, uh, it, it comes about, and at the middle of that tribulation period, the Antichrist, remember we looked at, he goes into the temple of God, which means it has to be rebuilt and that he sets himself up as God, to be worshipped as God, and he commits what we are told is the abomination of desolation. That he sets himself up at that point, that signals the beginning of the great tribulation. In the middle of the seven years, and for the next 42 months, three and a half years, it will be hell on earth, unlike anything that the world has ever, ever seen. So, he's saying, look, he's still being restrained. He hasn't come. This ha these things haven't gotten into motion yet. Be encouraged, Thessalonians. Be encouraged. You haven't missed anything. Things are still unfolding. And be encouraged, church. We haven't missed anything. Things are still unfolding. And there have been people throughout the centuries that name names and name dates and all of that. They come and go. And <laughs> I remember one guy had 88 reasons why Christ will return in 1988. And it didn't happen. So then he wrote the revised version. 89 reasons why Christ will return at 89. And I was like, seriously? And then after that, that didn't happen. And he just kind of fell off the face of the earth. But, which is probably a good thing. So here in verse 8, we see it, it, Paul covers this entire great tribulation period in one verse because he talks about this man of lawlessness being revealed and, and, and that this the things that have to take place there, and then he jumps out to the end. We looked at that. Prophetic writing sometimes jumps around with time. It, it doesn't respect chronological linear time like we do because it's God, and he's outside of that. And so he jumps forward in that verse out to the end of the Great Tribulation where Jesus comes and consumes the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. Uh, I love the way that that's phrased. It's how exciting that'll be that he wraps it all up. So that sets the stage for where we're going this morning as we look now at verse 9 because Paul will give us more information about this Antichrist, about oh, I've, uh, that I have sort of nicknamed for the purpose of our study today, the great counterfeit. He says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Noah Webster was a godly, godly man. And when he first wrote his dictionary, the definitions there were very consistent with things that, with, with, with how he rolled spiritually. Not so much anymore. I have a link, and it's, it's, it's out in public domain. I have a link to the 1828 Dictionary. Whenever I open my computer browser, I can click on it, and look up words that from Noah's, from Webster's original dictionary. He describes, or he defines the word counterfeit in this way. It says, to forge, to copy or imitate without, a, without authority or right, and with a view to deceive or defraud. That, folks, describes the Antichrist. That's who he is. He's a fraud. 
He's a deceiver. He's a counterfeit. Now, as mentioned, the Antichrist, this great counterfeit, will be empowered by Satan himself. That's clearly seen as you study the book of Revelation. Now, and nobody will be able to overcome him, and that will enable him to gain a worldwide following. This guy will be, I mean, before he <laughs> does what he does at the temple, this guy will be a rock star. I mean, not literally a rock star, but he will have, he'll be the guy with all the answers. He'll be the guy that, that soars in popularity. He'll be the one that everyone's looking to. Oh, man, you know, he has got the answers. And then, and then, his true colors are shown. I want to think about this for a minute. As we look at the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was given, Peter stands up, addresses the crowd. And I love that passage. We're not going to go through. We're just going to look at a couple of things here in verse 22. But where Peter addresses the crowd, 3,000 people give their lives to Christ that day. Interesting ratification of the new covenant 50 days after the, the covenant was inaugurated through the resurrection. Look back at the Old Testament. Oh, I could go there because the law is given on Mount Sinai 50 days after what happens. Uh, it's 50, and it's 50 days after they're delivered from Egypt through the Red Sea and all of that. And 50 days after the law is given, the, spirit, or the, the law comes down from Mount Sinai. Well, here on Pentecost, the, the Spirit comes down on Mount Zion. Uh, I, I, again, I love the types and the shadows, the fulfillments that are there. And, and as a result of the people's rebellion in, in Moses' day, 3,000 people died. As a result of the Spirit being given and Peter standing up at Pentecost, 3,000 people live. Amazing. You can't make it up. Anyway, in verse 22, <laughs> okay, so I did rabbit trail a bit. <laughs> I just love that story. Uh, in verse 22 here of the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, he says, men of Israel, this is Peter standing, he says, hear these words. Now, this is the same guy that just weeks before was standing and warming his hands at the enemy's fire, denying that he even knew him. But now, he has the Holy Spirit. Now, he's operating in power, and what a change. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you, as you yourselves also know. And so he goes on and he launches into this whole, it's a beautiful sermon that he gives there uh, uh, to the people. As I mentioned, 3,000 people give their lives to Christ. But as we see here in Acts, many other passages Jesus performed miracles, signs, and wonders. And they were always intended, and we, see, we unlock the intent here because he says, this man was attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs. That these were attesting miracles. That was always God's design. The primary purpose of those attesting miracles was to validate the message and the messenger uh, the message of the gospel, the message of the good news from God that man no longer would be subject to the penalty for his sins. And they were designed to lead people to the truth, to the truth of Jesus, to the truth of the gospel. So let's look at this for a moment. And I want to go back into the gospels. I want to look at a story from the gospel of Luke. And it's one of my favorites, and, I, and I, I freely confess, wherever I'm studying is usually my favorite, but this is just a great story. It's a great um, scene. Uh, so there's some guys, a group of guys, they, they took a paralyzed man, and they were trying to get to Jesus, and the crowd was just too thick. They couldn't get to him. And so they, somebody, somebody has this great idea, hey, I know, Let's go up on the roof and tear a hole in it. <laughs> and so they do that. And, and so they go up on the roof of this house. They know Jesus is inside and that he's doing his ministry and all of that. And the scene here, I picture Jesus kind of looking up at the ceiling and he's got crumbs of clods of dirt falling on his head. And, 
And all of a sudden, there's this guy that's like, reek, 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 in front of him. And, and the guy's probably looking at Jesus like, you know, it's my buddies. <laughs> and, and I just think it's just a, a great scene. So what's interesting is rather than heal the guy on the spot, in Luke chapter 5, we discover something really fascinating about these miracles and wonders and signs that Jesus performed. So breaking into the middle of the story, the man's just been lowered into the house in front of Jesus, probably staring at him, and Jesus staring at this guy. Uh, and it's where we're going to break into it in, the, at the beginning, in Luke chapter 5, verse 20, and talk about how Jesus responds to all of this. So in Luke 5, 20, I'll read through verse 24. It says, when he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I got to stop there for a second because this guy has been paralyzed. He's like, what? Um, kind of got some other issues going on here, Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And he's like, I, I would imagine that would be shocking. So going on, this is in the scribes and the Pharisees, and I always refer to these, the, the, the creepy religious guys, okay? Yeah, world's full of them. These guys in his day, in the first century, creepy religious guys, they began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Okay, and, and they probably had deep voices like that too. But <laughs> they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? standing there in their robes with their beads and their headpieces and all of this stuff. But when Jesus, verse 22, perceived their thoughts, yes, does Jesus read minds? <laughs> I think so. He perceived their thoughts. He answered, said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? What's up? <laughs> I mean, that would be our vernacular. What's up with you guys? <laughs> what are you doing? And then he says this, and this is noteworthy, this is important. He says, which is easier? And I love this, this is the way the Jewish dialogue goes. Tell me, gentlemen, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Got an answer? He doesn't give these guys a chance to, to even talk. He goes on, and this is key. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he, he, he shifts his focus from the guys, the religious guys, back to the man in front of him, this paralyzed guy that's still like, I don't know what's going on. My buddy's dropped me through the ceiling, and this guy just said my sins are forgiven, and I still can't move. But he looks at this guy now and he says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go home. Go to your house. Interesting. We see a very important principle here, guys. Uh, understanding that Jesus, he, he never performed signs and wonders and miracles. He never did that to wow people. He never did that to put on a show. He didn't, certainly didn't do it to entertain and by the way, a lot of what's passed off is miracle signs and wonders today. Sort of has that ring to it. Need to be very discerning. Does God still do miracles? Yeah, I believe he does. I hear reports, especially from other countries, some amazing signs and wonders and things that go on. And I believe that they're true. However, you've got to be really careful, really discerning with what's going on and what's the end of it. It, it, because here, he performed the signs and miracles and wonders. He literally bends the laws of physics, and he did that regularly. That gets your attention. If somebody does that, no mortal human person that's not God could ever do it. So he bends the laws of physics in order that people would be drawn to God. He does it so that they will understand that he alone has the power to forgive sin. That is the purpose, sole purpose, only purpose that he ever did signs and wonders and miracles. To validate the message, to validate the messenger. Now, the Antichrist, on the other hand, <clears throat> energized by Satan himself, by the way, 
will perform, we're told here, miracles, signs, and lying wonders. Interesting. The counterfeit. Imitating Jesus. And his purpose, now Jesus would do those to draw people to God. His purpose is to draw people away from God. That's the point. His purpose in doing so would be to intentionally deceive, to persuade people to believe a lie. And he'll have tremendous power to do so. You've got to understand, we have a formidable adversary. Now, I want to pause for a minute and remind us of something very important. When Jesus, in Matthew 16, was standing at Caesarea Philippi, (laughs) and again, I could go on, I, that's, that is an absolutely powerful passage. There he is at the cultic center of the, the region. There are all of these pagan gods represented in the niches of the cliffs and in this hole in the ground called the gates of hell where they believe the spirits went to and fro and all of that. I mean, and he says to them, he's talking to his men, he goes, the gates of hell, and I believe he pointed, I truly do, will not prevail against my church. Talking about the councils of the unseen world will not prevail against my church. But I'll tell you what, he never said they wouldn't try. And he does. Regularly. Yeah, and now the things that we're looking at here in Second Thess, those are going to be taking place after the church has been raptured off the planet. That's true. So we don't have to worry about this. We don't have a personal stake in the events that are taking place that we're studying other than to have understanding. However, as I mentioned last week, and, and, and as well, we all should know, our enemy at this moment goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's true. And that's sobering. And that's real. How does he do that? He does it through trickery, through deception. He does it through relentlessly trying to wear us down. I'll tell you, you know what? I had a week. (laughs) And I'm not here to say, oh, poor me. Not at all. Um, I'm blessed. But as far as spiritual battle, spiritual warfare goes on, I had a week. Probably because I was going to be teaching on spiritual warfare and the, the wiles of the adversary this morning... But I'll tell you, it was, just, it was just one day after another. I felt like I was walking through glass. And, and just the oppression the, and pushing away and getting, and just, no, I'm not going to go down that. And I'll tell you what, it's relentless at times, isn't it? He wears on us. He comes out, he hits us in our weaknesses. He hits us in our insecurities. He hits us in the areas that we're not necessarily strong. That's why we're so exhorted to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might so that we can withstand the assaults of the enemy. He also comes at us through untaught, and this is what the Bible says, this is not my opinion, through untaught and unstable people who distort the scriptures to their own destruction. Folks, you've got to understand that Satan, even though he's currently restrained, all of this, all of the things we go through, you've got to keep in mind, he is restrained. So you think it gets bad now? I look out on the political landscape, I look out on the social landscape, I look at what's happening in communities and school districts and all of the stuff, and I think that's Satan restrained? Yeah, that's Satan restrained. That's him being held back. Oh my goodness, what it'll be like when that restraint is taken out of the way. He actually has the power to mimic anything except one thing. Regeneration. Satan cannot impart life. If you are born again of God's Spirit, then you have experienced a supernatural event And it is as supernatural as him (laughs) bending the laws of physics because it it is an absolutely supernatural event that the Spirit of God would come and cleanse you from your sins 
and then take up residence inside of you to, for you now to be the temple of God. Because he doesn't use temples, as I mentioned last week. He doesn't use temples made with hands anymore. That's not it. He uses us. The representation of God on this planet now is us, is you and I. So not only will the Antichrist set out to deceive, but in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, the Antichrist, the beast, as he's called there, will be promoted by a second beast. Evidently, this one is lower in rank than he is. He's also known as the false prophet. And his purpose in the day of the Lord will be through great deception to promote the Antichrist as a substitute in place of Christ. Here's an excerpt. I want to just read a couple of verses out of Revelation 13 talking about this false prophet. It says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who shall dwell, who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs, and I'm not going to go, yeah, just, uh, I'd love to go there, but can't. We don't have time. He performs great signs. Here's this, this lying wonders thing. So that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Lying wonders. That's what Paul's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians. And, and folks, this shouldn't be a surprise to us because there are many places in Scripture where <clears throat> the activity of Satan and those who belong to him is described. We're going to look at one of them. Again, in the interest of time, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15, I'm going to, I'll just, I'll, stop and I'll pause as we go here. He says in verse 13, he says, for such are false apostles. Now, you know what an apostle is? A direct representative of Christ. All right? Now, that's different. <laughs> Paul defends his apostleship in, in Galatians. He says, look, I was taught by Christ himself because one of the accusations that people were levying against Paul was like, well, he's not part of that original bunch. He, wasn't even, he was still an enemy of the cross when Jesus you know, died and, and rose again and ascended and all that. But Paul himself says, look, I was one as one born out of due time. I am an apostle. I was taught by Christ himself, probably in his time in Arabia, where Jesus came to him and gave him great instruction. A direct representative. Now, we're talking about false apostles, and well, yeah, hey, and they are out there today. False apostles. I've been true. I have got a word from God Himself. I have been appointed to the office of apostle. Hogwash. Sorry, <laughs> that's a Greek word. Hogwash. Yon. <laughs> he says, such are false apostles. So they were in positions of great authority. That's the point. Uh, so false apostles during the end times will be people in the last day who will be in positions of great authority, spiritual, spiritual authority. Who is that? Oh, we could, we could go down the list. Is, is, he talking about, you know, is he talking about some of the charlatans that are out there? You know, is he talking about the Pope? <laughs> I don't know. False apostles. He says, going on in verse 13, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. I am a direct representative of Christ. And by what power? Well, by my own. <laughs> he says transforming themselves. He's not saying that they have been called of God. The devil is a deceiver. And so are his own. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. We see here that they're going to mimic and imitate the apostles of Christ. You might think of this as those who are in high positions of so-called spiritual authority. And there are those that have been recognized in high positions of spiritual authority. And I look around on the spiritual landscape and very often they don't fit the bill. We have to be careful. We have to be discerning. 
He goes on here in First Corinthians 11, or Second Corinthians 11, I mean, he says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, we're not talking about first century. We're not talking about at the end of the age. We're talking about right now, that he comes as an angel of light. And so part of the deception that will happen in that day is they'll bring an element of truth. Folks, there's always an element of truth mixed with the lie, always. That's what makes it palatable. They'll present with false integrity. Oh, yes, look at my pedigree. And they'll come as an angel of light. I'm here on a mission from God. Going on here in 2 Corinthians 11, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves, there's that term again, into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. That's sobering. He's talking about deceivers and deception. He's talking about counterfeits. And counterfeits, they're out there. So have you ever considered the fact that Satan has ministers? I think that that's a fascinating concept. Uh, But essentially, when you look at the word minister, it means servants. These are people who serve him, who serve Satan, working on his behalf. And throughout church history, there have been those who are false Christians. Uh, I was talking to Desiree after first service. You know the term rhino? Have you ever ever read that? That's like for people that that have the name of Republican, but they're Republican in name only. Yeah, you hear that in political circles tossed around. It's like, oh, you're not, you don't stand for what this party stands for. Well, I was trying to think of an acronym for Christian in name only, and I was like, Kino? And it does. Afterwards, she goes, that would be Chino. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so we're talking about Chinos or Chino, Christians in name only, because there are people that name the name of Christ that aren't. Uh, I, I'd love to use the example, and I mean no irreverence in this at all. I could go down to the pet store and get a puppy and name him Jesus and then come and tell you, you got to know Jesus. You're going you're gonna to love, and I know that that's an extreme example, but, but you, you understand that's the deception. That's, you know and I know that that's not the Jesus of the Bible. We know that, that, that's, not, that, that that's a deceptive thing. So he has to line up with what God's Word says, who he is and what he did. So they bring an element of truth and they present with false integrity and, and, and they go through this whole deal. And, and, and again, we, church history is, is replete with examples of people that were Christians in name only. And they're out there today. Different cult leaders, different people who are gathering. I mean, I remember the whole Jim Jones Guyana thing where this guy, he got a hold of people to the point where mass suicide we got to be careful. we got to be discerning. They present themselves as light bearers, don't they? But the salvation they offer, the message that they have, is not the message of salvation that comes exclusively through the Lord Jesus. And it's not the work. The, the work is not solely the work of the cross. There are always things that are tagged on. I grew up in a false religion and Oh, yeah, I was saved by grace through faith. And, 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 and. And There was a whole list of things that were expected of me to maintain my salvation. And I I was always nervous that I didn't have it. It's probably because I didn't until I gave my life to Jesus, the real Jesus, the, the Jesus of the Bible. Folks, the point in all of that is Paul is speaking of false apostles, false ministers, people that are working for the other side. He speaks of these guys in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, uh, and, and this is an extremely important verse to understand because he talks about the consequence of that. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven, and I think it's interesting that he says an angel from heaven, yes, an angel from heaven, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, 
then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. The word there in the original language is anathema. What does that mean? It means literally cursed of God. That's sobering. False teachers, false prophets, false apostles abound in our day as well. You've got to understand there are a lot of counterfeits out there. How do you know? We're going to talk about at the end of the message, we're going to talk about how to spot them because you don't spot them by going hunting for false teachers. You spot them by understanding what good doctrine and good teaching is. But they abound. And we need to be watchful. We need to be diligent. And what we take in is truth. To make sure it lines up with God's word. So moving into verse 10 here, uh, we're going to back up to verse 9 because otherwise we break in the middle of a sentence. uh, So verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. When he speaks of all manner of unrighteous deception, he's saying that every sort of evil that deceives, understand this, every sort of evil that deceives is the Antichrist's method of operation. That's his MO. It's deception. It's the father of lies. Notice he says those who are perishing. You know, have you heard the term mass casualty event? I remember in 2004, I remember exactly where I was when I turned on the television and I heard about this massive earthquake uh, out in the Pacific near Thailand and uh, this giant tsunami that came ashore. And by the end of it all, there were like, what, 230 or something like that thousand people who died. That's a mass casualty event. When, you, when there are a, a huge number of people that are, that are wiped out. When he talks about those who are perishing, this is a mass casualty event. Vast numbers of people will follow the counterfeit, believe his lies, and perish as a result. Revelation 13, again, the world that's believing in the lies of the Antichrist, following after him, worshiping him, they will ask, and and it will be with a sense of adulation, who is like the beast? Who is like him? Ah, yes. We love that he's there. We love the work he's doing. Who is like the beast? And ultimately, all who receive his mark, the mark of the beast, worship his image, will die. They will perish, as we're reading here in verse 10, which means they will be lost forever. No hope of redemption. The reason that they perish, look at the last part of verse 10. They will perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. People will have every opportunity to believe and be saved. But this indicates that they hear the truth, they understand the truth, but it says here that they have no love of the truth. And because of that, as a result, they refuse to believe the truth. So this is important. It teaches us that people willfully choose to harden their hearts against God's truth. It's a willful act. No, 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 I know, and I have had people up in my face before. No, I will not believe that. Don't even bring it up anymore. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Put cotton in my ears. I don't want it. I don't want to hear the truth of the gospel. And and I got to tell you something here, too. I'm not talking about deep theological concepts here. I'm not. I'm not talking about, and I love deep theological concepts. I love to sit at my desk. I was talking to Darren the other day, and it was like 7 o'clock at night, and we were talking. I said, man, I just have been 
immersed in just I get I get into this stuff and it's like I just love my time studying. I've told you before, this is just mopping up. This is just kind of cleaning up. <laughs> Cause my real time where I have just a, a great fun is is in digging around with these things. And I said, I sat down at 6.30 this morning and here it's 7 o'clock at night. It's like, oh, I think I probably need to take a break. I love the knowledge of the truth. What these people are saying is they refuse to believe it. I'm not talking about, again, this isn't deep stuff. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Jesus loves me, this I know. Amen. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Folks, that's the gospel. That's the Jesus that we love and serve. That's the one that we spend our lives adoring. He's the one that died for me. And like I said, I love theology. I love doing deep dives. I love all the nuts and bolts and the language studies and all the stuff. I, for me, that's just great fun. But the truth of the gospel, the core of the message, is so simple. And it's so beautiful that people miss it. After all, how hard is it to believe that if you confess with your mouth uh, the, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead that you shall be saved? How hard is that? How hard is it for me to believe that, that, that I'm a sinner and to understand that I'm a sinner and that there is something wrong in all of us, something desperately wrong? We're all broken. How hard is it to understand that when you really are honest with yourself and that God provided a way to forgive me that doesn't depend on me because I can't get there? That God did the work through believing that Jesus died for us, rose again on the third day, the firstborn of the resurrection, ensuring what? That you and I will resurrect as well. People hear that. They understand what it means, but they choose to harden their hearts against the truth of God. It's a choice. It's a willful act. God's gift of salvation is available to anyone and everyone. However, the flip side of that is that God will give them over to darkness if that's what they choose. Period, end of story. He will do it. And it's not because, and he's not at fault. Let's go on. Verse 11. He says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. For what reason? Because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For that reason. That's what he's talking about. In context, that's what he's saying. You have a choice. Don't give me this thing, this irresistible grace and that I, there's no way that I can make that choice myself unless I'm already regenerated. I just do not see that. I see that man has a responsibility to make a choice. So a person can resist the truth so long, uh, for so long that eventually they become deluded. A delusion means you believe what's false. They actually become delusional about the things of God because they've resisted and resisted and resisted and resisted. If someone persists in hardening their heart toward God, eventually they'll come to a place where they will be unable to believe. Paul talks about it. I believe he tells Timothy, he talks about that man's conscience or that woman's conscience is seared. Have you ever taken like, take a, like a big chunk of, of beef and, and you, you, man, I'll tell you what, I turn that barbecue all the way up. I get it as hot as I can get it. Because when I drop that meat on there, I want to sear it. What does that mean? That means I want to seal it off so that the juices can't come out, so that it's a nice juicy cut when I eat it. That's to sear the meat, to sear the beef. What he's talking about, using that same word picture, that same analogy, if that man's conscience is seared, that means it has been sealed off against the things of God. And having their conscience seared, 
they do not, can no longer believe. Because they have said, I don't want it. I do not. And they have been very resolute, very firm. Does God leave the door open? Yes. It's his will that all come to repentance. But he knows that not all will. Essentially, too, God is not to blame. If a person rejects salvation through Christ, it is a, a result of that, that person's own willful ignorance, their own willful resistance. Tragically, what we're reading in verse 11 here is that if they reject Christ, it will leave them susceptible to believing the lie. Now understand here in verse 11 it says the lie. That's a definite article in front, not a lie, but the lie. So what is the lie that they're going to believe in? I don't know. But I'll give you some examples. I'll give you some possibilities. <clears throat> and you might have your own opinion about it. That's fine. Don't pick a fight with me. <laughs> Here's the first uh, of what the lie that he's talking about here. Uh, the first, and that's that the lie is a reference to the Antichrist himself. And many people believe that that's what Paul is referring to. Now, think about it. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the Antichrist is anti-that, then is he the personification of the lie? Could be. Fits the context. Because rejecting the true Christ, the world will believe in and receive and worship the counterfeit. Here's the second thing. Many people believe that the lie will be the Antichrist's explanation of what happened to the church in the rapture. And there are people that believe that. I don't. <laughs> and, and you can if you want. It's a possibility, but there's very little. There's not much to support that that's what's going on here. Uh, I believe that that is fresh enough in the people's minds that Paul would have elaborated on it, and it's not. Here's another possibility, and this one, again, it's plausible. Again, you can choose. Nobody's going to lose their salvation over one position or the other here. It's just a matter of, of you know, what you believe fits. Uh, that's the lie, it, it, that it's the lie that, that people will be able to become like God. And that fits. There's some weight to it in Scripture because it's the same lie that Satan told Eve in the garden. How did he tempt Eve? He said, God's lying to you. I'm not the deceiver. God is. And he knows the day that you eat of that tree, you'll be just like him. You can be like God. And I'll tell you what, there is a place in fallen humanity where, where fallen man is drawn to the idea of being their own God. In Genesis, Genesis we read that God made them in his own image. But men and women throughout history have been remaking God in their own image. I want God in my back pocket. And I, I, I resist looking as ill as I feel when somebody starts off a, a sentence or makes a comment about, well, my God would never. And it's like, oh, I really don't care about your God. I care about the God of the Bible. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, Paul's talking about the world living in rebellion against God, and he says the following. He says, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So in other words, they're, they're worshiping mankind. They're worshiping the earth. How often do you see that tossed around? They're worshiping the counterfeit. And in doing so, they're refusing to worship the one whose creation it is. All of this is tied to the mindset that people will have in the day of the Lord. And how the Antichrist is lying about God and lying about himself. So we're going to finish up this morning with verse 12. And so again, for context, we'll go through verse 11 again. He says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion 
that they should believe the lie, that they, may, uh, that they all may be condemned who did not, did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mass casualty event. There's a bunch of them in the book of Revelation. Truly. People are going to believe the lie to the point of delusion. And vast numbers of people will die as a result. This is sobering. It's a sobering, it's a powerful and awful destiny for those who reject God's truth. Looking back, back again at Romans chapter 1, God gave them over. It, it, we see there, he's, he gave them over, we looked at it last week, to their vile passions. He gave them over to all of their evil desires. Why? Because they didn't want God in their lives. They suppressed the truth. They sat on it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. That's suppressing the truth. They replaced God's truth which is objective reality, real truth, with their own version, subjective. You guys know the difference between objective reality and subjective truth, objective truth? Objective truth is where if I were to tell you, okay, hey, I want you to go out in the back parking lot right outside that door. My car's parked over there. It's the black car. It's the black Toyota Prius. I know, don't hate me for that. It's it's the black Toyota Prius over in the corner. And you walk out the door and you go, well, Pastor John, your, your Prius is silver. Well, it's black to me. My car identifies as black. <laughs> I don't care. Objectively, it's silver. Subjectively, you can call it anything you want. It does not change the fact that it is what it is. Oh, I'm not going to (laughs) launch. I'm I'm so tempted. But you know, there's a lot of that going on out there, isn't there? A lot of subjective stuff. I don't care how you identify. You either are or you're not. We were driving down the road here in front of the church one Sunday a few months ago. This is a big old jacked up Ford pickup. And, and it was at, sitting at the part at the light down there on Highway 99. And, and, and the, across the back, somebody, they'd had lettering done, you know, made up. And it said, I identify as a Prius. And I just laughed. I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay, you can identify as a Prius all you want. You're still a big Ford truck. <laughs> Objective truth. That's what we're after. That's what we want. So where do we get it? I don't know about you, but I believe Jesus. He said, my word, thy word is truth. You want to know the source for truth? It's right here. Yeah. I don't want somebody's subjective ideas about it. I want to know him through it. Romans 132 tells us, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So even knowing that, that they'll be judged, that judgment is coming, this is how perverse, this is how warped mankind is, the human heart becomes harder and harder every time that a sinner rejects the truth of Christ. That in turn makes it easier and easier during the end times for them to turn to Satan and to turn to the Antichrist. And folks, we're on the road to that place now. Uh, People are turning away from God in record numbers. People are turning to believe the lies that are out there in our culture, in our government, and and, and just in every corner of society. There are things that are happening, and we need to be people who are committed to searching out and living for and living by God's truth. So to sum up, there's a powerful force of evil working in the world today, and there is. I don't think anybody would argue with that. In this portion of Scripture, we've also read that the work of Satan is being restrained. And we know the restrainer is none other than the Holy Spirit. 
But a time will come that the Holy Spirit will remove his restraining hand. And at that point, the world will plunge into darkness like never before known in human history. The day of the Lord will fall on a world that is chosen, underscore chosen, to live in defiance against God. What a frightening world that'll be. Absolutely frightening. The scripture teaches that the church will be raptured before then. And folks, I, I, just, I draw great comfort from knowing that we're not going to be here for all of this. And we'll be with our brothers and sisters in heaven in our Father's house as all of this unfolds. Wrap up with a couple of things here. The first is this. Garbage in, garbage out. You know what that means? Have you ever heard that term? Now, when I, when I was in high school, my girlfriend's mom worked for Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena. I lived right near there. That's where I grew up. And she was a computer programmer. This is back in the days when they had rooms full of computers with the big spinning tapes on them that you see in the old movies and stuff. And she was a computer programmer. She got really frustrated one day at work, and she typed some stuff into the computer <laughs> out of her frustration, and she shut it all down. I mean, she came home, and she was like, I shut down Jet Propulsion Labs today. I was <laughs> like, What? Yeah, I typed some stuff in that I just got really, oh boy, I got in trouble, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. At any rate, garbage in, garbage out, it's a, it's a computing term, and it's used to express the idea that in computing, incorrect or poor quality input will always produce faulty output. And that's true, but it's not just true in computing. <laughs> now, in believing the lie, we see here that they go out and build their lives around it to their own great detriment, to their own demise. So there's an immutable principle connected to all of this. And this is one I've gone over before, and I'll go over it again, because when I say it's an immutable principle, that means it, I don't care who you are, this applies to you, because it applies to me, and it applies to all of us. It is unchanging. That's what immutable means. And, and this is it. You will always, always, always act on what you believe. Every single time. You will always act on what you believe. You believe a lie, you're going to act on it. I don't know how many times I have an emotional response to something and, and I kind of make up a story in my head, well, my wife's mad at me or this or that or the other thing. Pretty soon I'm acting on it, and she's going, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> because it, we act on what we believe, don't we? Well, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to this, it's kind of important that we understand that we need to believe the right stuff. Counterfeits are out there. Do not be deceived. Because they're out there, and the intent is to deceive. They don't come to you and say, hey, I'm going to deceive you now. <laughs> that would be silly. No, they just have crafty ways to deceive. The point in that is be careful what you take in. The second thing here is inspect the fruit. <laughs> yeah, be a fruit inspector. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 John, the apostle, as an old man, he writes this. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So now I, I want to make something clear. I am not suggesting that we become one another's fruit inspectors. <laughs> That's not it. No, I am not inviting us to now start being critical of one another. <laughs> I saw you said a curse word you know, or whatever it is. That's not it. That's not it. I'm talking about false teaching and false teachers. So, so, so yeah, get that out of your mind. We're to have grace for one another. We're to understand and walk in the, in the understanding that we're all, as I mentioned, we all are broken in ways and we just have a great amount of grace and understand that we're all in process and 
you know, if, if I love Jesus, then, you know, he's working in me in ways that you don't probably understand. And he's working in you in ways I don't understand. So what do we do? We have grace for one another. That's how we get along. That's why a great deal of the New Testament is devoted to, this is how you get along with each other. So I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. He says, either assume the tree to be good as well as its fruit good, or assume the tree to be bad as well as its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now, in that case, he's talking about the creepy religious guys, all right? You know, they're religious leaders of his day. I love calling them the creepy religious guys because they were. They were creepy and they were religious. <laughs> they didn't have a relationship with God. The, the, he's talking about them. He's talking about false teachers. He's talking about the people that were misleading lots of people. So, we're to inspect the fruit because it'll tell us about the teacher. So how do you do that? I'll give you three ways. First, what does the teacher say about the person and the work of Christ? That's it? Yeah, that's it. The person of Christ. Who is Jesus? As I mentioned, he's not a puppy that I got down at the store. And, and, I, and again, I don't mean anything irreverent by that, but I mean people will portray Jesus in all kinds of crazy ways. If it doesn't line up with God's word, you need to dismiss it. Is he the son of God? Is he fully God, fully man? Is he the son of God born to this world to grow up, to, to, to take my sins to the cross, to die in my place, to be put in a grave, but because he had led a perfect life, death couldn't hold him, so he raises from the dead first born of the resurrection, and then a few weeks later rises up and, and ascends into heaven so that he can make intercession for me and for you. Is that the Jesus that they're talking about? So what do they say about the person, who Jesus is, and the work, what he accomplished? Because there's salvation in no other name under heaven through which a man can be saved. Make sure that it lines up with truly with who he is, what he did. The second thing is, do they preach a biblical gospel? Again, I grew up in a false religion where it was mostly true, but not. <laughs> a lot of things kind of tagged on. A lot of things added. It wasn't until I started reading my Bible that I figured out that, oh boy, this is not the direction, this ain't the train I want to be on. So are they preaching a biblical gospel? And just the gospel? Or is it the doctrines of men? Finally, does that teacher exhibit godly character that glorifies the Lord? Because one of the marks of false teachers is pride. You need to follow me. You need to do what I'm telling you because I actually, after all, I have a special in with God. I'm hearing from the Lord, and so you need to hear from me. Hog wash. That's not true. I, I told somebody once, I don't have a red phone. I promise. I don't. You have equal access to the Father. I will pray for you because part of what I'm called to do is to pray. And I love my flock and I love the people and I, and I love praying for y'all as, as things come up. But this is equal standing before the Lord. So you got to understand uh, you, if you're dealing with somebody that's very prideful and arrogant and they're claiming to be in spiritual leadership, run. Run. That person should understand their place and that should be marked by humility and godly character. Enough said. Finally, lighten up. Lighten up. At the end of it all, Folks, number one, we won't be here for all of this, for the cataclysmic events that are going to come upon the earth. We'll be at home with the Lord. We'll actually be coming back with him when he returns. That's amazing. I, again, we could get into all that. But understand that when Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions, 
I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I when I when I've accomplished that, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself. That where I am, you there you may be also. Those are promises for the church. That's not part of what's happening here. And after that, after all of it's wrapped up, and something in in Peter's second letter, in chapter three, uh, he talks about something, and I believe that this is after the great tribulation. This is after the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. Uh, and there are different views. Again, you can have a different one if you want. That's fine. <laughs> Don't send me emails. But in second Peter three thirteen, Peter writes this. He says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Our response to that knowledge what we look forward to then. He says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, and this is for us, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Uh, what a wonderful way to, I mean, to wrap up a hard-hitting passage because it's hard-hitting for the world, for the unbelieving world out there but our destiny looks entirely different than the things we're talking about here. I talk often about having a burden for the lost. That's a healthy thing because these things will happen. It's not fairy tales. It's not Bible stories. They're prophetic events that have not yet unfolded. And when they do, it'll be late, too late to turn back. When they do, it will be very difficult. Yeah, will people come to the Lord through the tribulation? I believe they will. But I believe it will be extremely costly. And again, that's a message for another day. So, uh, But suffice it to say, God has great things in store for us. When we're forever in his presence and enjoying, just enjoying being with the Lord, not having to walk by faith any longer, where my faith will be my eyes. I love that. There's a line from a song that I've always thought was just very appropriate because then, face to face. Now, we see in the glass dimly, don't we? But then, face to face. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap up this morning, we're just grateful, Lord, that we belong to you. Lord, for anybody that doesn't belong to you, that for anyone who perhaps you're tugging on their heart at this moment, whether it's in this room or perhaps online, I pray, Father, that you would stir their heart, that they would cross over, that they would say, I don't want to be part of that crowd. I don't want to be part of that group. I don't want to live deceived. I'm hungry for you, Lord. I'm hungry for truth. I'm hungry for Jesus. And if that's you, give your life to Jesus today. And then I can't encourage you enough, tell someone about it. Tell someone about it. Make that decision and come into the kingdom. Father, for the rest of us, we pray that you would just work in our hearts, that you would drive these truths home, that we would have a great burden for the lost, that we would, uh, seeing the holiday approaching Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Lord, that that we would just be in an attitude of rejoicing and that, that, Lord, that that would be an infectious thing, that those around us would want to know why we're so excited about the things that are going on in our world, Lord. When everything looks so bleak, Lord, we know that that you are uh, the one who brings beauty from ashes. So, Lord, we pray work in our hearts, work in our lives, work in our community. We give ourselves afresh to you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.